Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast, where we celebrate individuals and families, businesses, and organizations that seek out and promote the exploration, stewardship, conservation, access, and enjoyment of the outdoors. Our sponsor of today's episode is Gulf Shores and Orange Beach Tourism. Warm temps and fresh seafood make the Alabama Gulf Coast the perfect destination for your family vacation, couples getaway, outdoor adventure, meetings, conferences, and conventions. Our guest today is Courtney Weatherby. Courtney is the Coastal Outreach Manager for Alabama Audubon. She is an environmental educator and conservationist. She loves spending time outdoors in a variety of capacities, birding, fishing, kayaking, snorkeling, or diving whenever the opportunity arises. Courtney, it's a pleasure to have you on the Outdoor Adventure Series. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me on today, Howard. Fantastic. And, and, and um, as I was reading the introduction on my end and then kind of starting to read about a little bit more about you, and I'm thinking Alabama, Gulf Shores, the water, nature, I, I'm sure you have uh, a lot of free time to do all those activities. You have work is just a piece of cake and you're just out there enjoying yourselves all the time. Well, I'm fortunate enough that my work takes me outside quite a bit, but you know, when you live in a beautiful place like lower Alabama, the opportunities to get outside and recreate are really endless. So I definitely try to take advantage of that as well. Fantastic. And I do have to admit in the spirit of full disclosure, I lived in Alabama for a year, a long time ago. Let's just say it was probably about half my life ago. We won't go into that <laughs> into any more detail. But as I look back, even within that year, I did not take advantage of the outdoors and the the wonderful uh, nature, the water, the birding uh, that Alabama had to offer. And I'm really excited to be able to get down there in September to explore. And so your interview today is it's just really going to help whet my appetite and I'm sure my fellow outdoor uh, writers their appetite as well to come down and enjoy uh, South Alabama so thank you again yeah it'll be great to have you back and to introduce some new people to the uh, best kept, best kept secret down here in lower Alabama fantastic and so what I'd love to do if we can before we kind of dive into Alabama Audubon and uh, what your perspective is of why Southern Alabama, why Audubon, is just to learn a little bit more about you and your work. So tell us a little bit about your background. Okay. So I was born and raised in the great state of Nebraska. Go Big Red, go Huskers. And growing up, um, my dad is an avid angler and hunter and outdoorsman. And he and my mom both really gave my brother and I a lot of opportunity to explore the outdoors and figure out how we connect with nature. And while I enjoy enjoying the outdoors in a lot of different ways, I've always really been drawn to the water. And that led me to pursuing a major in college in marine biology. And when I tell people that, I get some like head tilts and some funny looks and they're like, <laughs> how are you born and raised in Nebraska? And you wanted to major in marine biology. And I don't really have a great answer to it other than I was just, it was something that I was really drawn to and I think it was kind of meant to be. So I went to a school in Missouri, again, no ocean there, but we partnered with the University of Southern Mississippi. And so I spent all my summers down in Ocean Springs, Mississippi, and I was taking my marine science coursework. So that's how I got my, my background in marine science. And then after I graduated, I've been super fortunate to work in some incredible places that also afford me the opportunities to play a lot outside. Places like the Florida Keys, Charleston, South Carolina, Alaska, the Chesapeake Bay in Virginia. And I'm down here in lower Alabama. And all of my jobs before this one were all about marine science education and conservation. And how I got into birding was thanks to a coworker when I worked in Charleston. And I have to admit to people that when I first learned that like going out and looking at birds and identifying birds was a thing that people did, I was really into it. I kind of wrote it off. 
but birding really snuck up on me. Okay. And I just like had all these opportunities to go out with some really incredible birders, some really great mentors of mine. And then all of a sudden I just had, would have one neat experience and then another. And then before I knew it, just bam, I was, I was a birder. And that now it is something that brings me a lot of joy and it is just as big of a part of my career as anything else. And what drew me to this position with Audubon is that it puts science and conservation hand in hand with education. And that is really all that I've ever wanted to do is to connect people with nature and to help give them ways that they can help protect it. And that's really the goal of National Audubon and Alabama Audubon is to protect birds and the habitat that they rely on through science and advocacy and education. So, Very good. And you really had me wondering of Nebraska, Missouri, and where is that little entry into, of, of water? And I'm, I'm glad you elaborated on that. And, and the places that you have experienced your learning uh, the Chesapeake, Florida Keys, gol- the Gulf. It, you, you've been at the the creme de la creme of outdoor venues, and I, I think that is just absolutely phenomenal. Question that I have before we kind of dive uh, into the again the Alabama Audubon is, as an avid birder, what was that moment where your interest kind of tip to, why am I going to be interested in this? What's in it for my interest, my education, my passion? What was that that moment th- that occurred for you? Yeah, I definitely didn't think that I was going to be into the whole birding thing. And I certainly didn't think that I was going to enjoy it to the extent that I do. And definitely didn't think that it was going to become a huge part of my career. But like I said, um, it's just these small bird and nature moments that I kept having. And I feel like it's almost like any hobby that you have, you start it and then something cool happens and it draws you in a little bit more. Right. So I remember, like, for example, I remember seeing an anhinga, which is a mostly black bird and it's breeding plumage. And it has this gorgeous teal eye ring that just really pops on an otherwise black bird. And I was just like, wow, that's super, super cool. Or getting to see like a black-throated blue warbler for the first time and thinking to myself that maybe warblers would be the frustration to learn and figure out because they can be hard to identify, right? So that was a big part of it. And then another kind of like funny thing that drew me into birding is that um, my coworker that was really into birding, she knew that I loved like I loved fish and marine invertebrates, right? And I just loved the diversity and the different adaptations and stuff like that. And she looked at me one day and she goes, me, birds have all those things as well. They have cool niches and adaptations and stuff like that. And you don't have to be underwater to see them. They are all around you. And so once she said that, it kind of just clicked for me. And it was almost like a challenge where I started looking at birds and being like, oh, is she right? And it turns out that she was right, which really just like drew me more into paying more attention about those birds. So like any hobby, people really get into you, have cool experiences that draw you in and keep you coming back for more. Very good. One last question, because you're you're piquing my curiosity here. Okay. What is the equipment? What let me rephrase that. What is the must-have equipment that a aspiring birder needs? Besides their eyes, let's just say that's the obvious one. <laughs> and ears, got to have eyes and ears. <laughs> and ears, yeah. And ears. What are the pieces of equipment that are an absolute necessity for an aspiring birder? I would say a good mentor, somebody who is um, patient with you and can just be ready to help answer the same question about the same bird 50 times. I had a couple of people like that in my life that I'm really thankful for. But just like a good pair of binoculars. And I mean, people are very particular about the binocular brands that they love and trust. And everybody kind of has an opinion about it. So I would recommend people trying different binoculars. You can go to a sporting goods store, like a Bass Pro Shop or something like that. 
And you can really get a good pair of binoculars for close to $100, or you can really go out and spend thousands of dollars on binoculars. But just a good pair of binoculars to get you into it are super important. Okay. And how about uh, a notebook or are there guides, go-to guides that you would recommend to an aspiring birder? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of birders will keep a, a life list, so a list of all the new bird species that they see. And things like the Sibley Guide is also like a really great place to start. That is my trusted book that I've had since I've started birding and it's almost starting to fall apart on me. But there are also um, different apps. We are we live in an app world now. And so there's two apps that I highly recommend for people getting into birding. The first of which would be eBird. And eBird is a platform by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And you can go in and keep a list of your birding adventures. So it will keep track of where you went birding, um, the birds that you saw, and if you wanted, like, keep track of how many of each species that you saw. And then you can keep like little notes and stuff in those lists as well. So you can kind of keep it like a little birding diary if you are into things like that. That's how I use it. But the cool thing about eBird is that it is also like a citizen science platform. So all of those entries that you see of birds go into a larger database that scientists can use for bird research, which is awesome as well. The second app that I would definitely recommend to people is the Merlin Bird ID app. And I recommend this to everyone, people who have been birding for a long time, people who are new birders, for two reasons. They have an identification help feature that will ask you five basic questions about the bird that you saw and are trying to identify. Based on how you answer those questions, it will give you a smaller list of birds that you probably saw that you're probably looking at instead of having to flip through an entire bird guide. So that's really helpful to help to have that smaller list to kind of sort through. The second feature that I really love is the sound ID feature. And so you can bring it up on your phone and you press the little record button. And as it picks up bird singing, it will start to populate a list of the birds that are singing around you until you hit like the stop record button. And then as a certain species sings, it will actually highlight like that bird's name. So for me, it was helpful to hear the bird singing and it would highlight that it is a wide-eyed vireo or a Carolina wren and stuff like that. So it's really helpful to learn your bird calls, but also just fun to sit on the back porch in the evening and turn it on and see what birds are singing around you. So it's a really fun app to use as well. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate you sharing that. Uh, that app, especially Merlin, and and I will say now eBird because I've had Merlin on my phone probably a year and a half, maybe a little more. I learned about it uh, when I was at our our conference, the Outdoor Writers Association of America's conference in uh, in it was J Peak, Vermont, and we went out with an <laughs> avid birder, Bridget Butler, who she's like into quote unquote slow birding, just. Do it slow, take your time. And I really loved it. And so now my my go-to on the weekends is I sit outside. Uh, my my roommate has a great backyard and I just sit out with a cup of coffee, just waiting mm -hmm. for birds to show up. And I actually, I hear doves all the time. And I for a while, I thought they were owls. And I was informed <laughs> last year that those are not owls, Howard, those are doves. And so finally, these two doves showed up and I took a photo of them and I, I did the recording with the, the record the sound. And it's like, mm -hmm. sweet, this is great. So I, I appreciate you sharing those two apps and they are wonderful. And we'll provide the backlinks uh, to Merlin and eBird in our show notes. So you are here today to introduce us to the Alabama Audubon. So I am a member of the uh, Nevada Audubon. I've gone out mm -hmm. a couple times. We just, designated a national monument. It's called a Viquame, which is just about a 60-mile cool. drive south of Las Vegas. And the Alabama, Las Vegas Audubon was down there doing some birding. And I'm thinking, God darn it, Howard, if you hadn't been home in what's on the computer, doing things on a computer, you could have been out there enjoying yourself. And But I know I'm going to be coming down to Alabama to enjoy myself with Alabama Audubon. But for our listeners, what is the Audubon and what's 
it on a national level and what makes it unique uh, for the state of Alabama? Yeah, for sure. So I work for Alabama Audubon, which is a separate organization from the National Audubon Society. We are a recognized chapter, a recognized Audubon chapter. And there are hundreds of recognized Audubon chapters across the United States. And we actually have two located right here in the Mobile Bay region. It is us and then the Mobile Bay Audubon Society. Now, both National Audubon and all of these local chapters, their goal is to protect birds and the places that they need to survive. And each chapter might have a different focus area or specific mission and how they're going to accomplish that. But we are all working towards the protection of birds and helping to connect people with ways to do that. So Alabama Audubon, we were formerly known as Birmingham Audubon. We had a name change a couple of years ago to um, better encompass the work we do statewide. And we were established in 1946. And our mission is to promote conservation and a greater knowledge of birds, their habitat, and the natural world. So we do that through a variety of active science and conservation work through educational opportunities, community events. And like you said, we always like to get out and do a bunch of birding whenever we can as well. Focusing in specifically on what our coastal office does is we opened in 2017, thanks to funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and the Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. And I feel like in order to better understand the work that we are doing and the need for it, it helps to take a step back and paint the picture of what is going on with shorebirds on a more global scale. So over the past 50 years, shorebird populations have dropped roughly 40%, which is a big number. And that is largely due to the fact that humans are altering the landscape and ecosystems in a lot of different ways all across the globe. So these birds who some migrate 10, 12,000 miles a year, um, these birds are facing new and evolving threats at their nesting grounds, their migratory stopovers, and their wintering sites. So in order to hopefully slow that decline, it is important for scientists and people involved in making management decisions to have the data on what critical habitat do these birds really need to survive? What specific threats are they facing at different locations? And then what is their reproductive success? And so our work down the coast with Alabama Audubon is a part of gathering all of that information. Now, we have a handful of birds here in Alabama that we refer to as our priority species. And these birds are of special focus for us because they lay their eggs directly on the sand in our beaches. And I mean like literally right in the sand, not in a bush or a tree where it can kind of be out of harm's way, they're directly on the ground. And they are tiny and they are camouflaged and being right on the ground, that really opens them up to a variety of different threats, which we help to try and help mitigate. So shorebird nesting season on Alabama is roughly May through August. And during that time, our team is conducting surveys to identify active nesting sites. Once we find these nests, we track them to see if they are successful in raising a chick to the point where it is like a flight capable juvenile, at which point it odds, it odds for survival increase dramatically. Or if the nest fails or the chicks die, we collect the data of why that happened. So that's like a, a simplified version of what our biologists are doing over the nesting season. And really like finding and tracking down these nests is like finding a needle in a haystack, if you will. So it's a time consuming job. Uh, also during the nesting season, we have an awesome group of staff and volunteers that we refer to as our coastal bird stewards. And throughout the nesting season, they will set up at busy beaches or active nesting sites and educate people about the beach nesting birds. 
we have these really cute signs that say, ask me about the birds. And we have these bright green neon shirts that say that as well. So that's kind of like people's invitation to come over and chat with us um, if they're interested. And then we just get to tell them about these birds and different ways that they can help protect them while they're out on the beach. So we do all of that. And then during the rest of the year, when it's not nesting season, we continue to conduct different types of bird surveys of both our priority species and all of the birds that are around using our Gulf Coast habitats. And then we host bird walks and different environmental education programs as well. Fantastic. Now, a number of questions have risen to, to the surface for me is all right. for the, the, the shore birds, and I think it's just amazing that these birds are going to come and congregate on the shore, on the, in the sand, birth an egg and just, or lay an egg, sit and then stay with it until hopefully we have a successful birth uh, uh, of the chick. And mm -hmm. so a couple questions that I'm curious about is there, there's the issue of climate change, the, mm -hmm. when and that, that will affect their ability when they're going to fly and where they're going to be able to land and the things that go into that. But once they, they find land, it, and, they, I, and I'm, a, I'm going to make a, an assumption, and you're going to say, Howard, that is so wrong, or Howard, that was great. Do they, do they have an idea that they're going to collectively in large groups pick a spot, or is it random? I mean, the Gulf shores area in Alabama. I mean, we're, we're not talking hundreds upon hundreds of miles here. Okay. okay. Now you could probably tell me how many miles of shoreline there is uh, on the Gulf, but you know, the, the, the spot that they're going to pick are all the, the, the same birds coming to the same spot or are they spread out throughout the, 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 the beautiful white sands in, in Alabama and beyond? Well, that is a really fantastic question. And these birds, they aren't like a sea turtle that will come back to like its natal beach and lay its eggs there. It's not that type of thing. But some of these birds, being we know this because we have banded birds and we see them come back year after year. So if they come to a site in Alabama and it feels safe for them and they deem it as like a successful site, then they will return to a similar location year after year. Um, and use that. But it's not like the exact same location. It's like, oh, we know that these two birds generally like to lay their nest in this 100 yard stretch of beach. So we know to really like look for those birds in there. But sometimes they pull switcheroo on us and they pick a whole new location. So it just depends. Okay. And the way to protect the birds and also prevent the predators because there are predators out there and not, and not just inconsiderate predators like human beings who just <laughs> think, oh God, I can go walk anywhere on the beach and I'm going to let my dog loose on the beach, et cetera, et cetera. How are you protecting the bird so that people like me and the predators we don't really have a lot of control over? How do, how do, what are some of the things that the Audubon is doing to at least make it a lot tougher for humans and predators to to get to those birds and what the eggs are laid. Yeah. So as far as trying to help humans learn where these nests are, one of the big things that we do is when we um, find a nest, we will go out and we have big eye-catching signs that say, do not enter active bird nesting. And we will sense off the area. We will put multiple of those signs and then put bright yellow paracord around all of those posts um, to help identify that site and the boundaries of it, which you think would be enough to keep people out. But sometimes we have people that still just choose to walk right through there. But that is the main thing we do to really help keep people out of those areas. And then we just, we educate people as much as possible. The more that people know, um, the more that they can hopefully change their actions while on the beach to help benefit these birds and other wildlife as well. When it comes to the predators, it is important that these birds have a lot of habitat so they can hopefully spread out away from the predators. But predators are one of the biggest things that we do face because when they find these eggs, they're like, ooh, this is a great food source. And they tend to come back to that site to check it out. So, 
what kind of predators are we talking about in that case? Great question. We have a lot of different predators that these birds face um, from things like larger birds, like seagulls and crows to things like ghost crabs that are on the beach. They will um, try and eat the eggs. We also have fox and coyote and raccoons and uh, the list kind of goes on and on. Anything that can find those that's kind of opportunistic is going to take advantage. Okay. Okay. Now, you had mentioned as you were uh, describing the Audubon, the difference between the Mobile and, and Alabama Audubon and, and the focus on the, these shorebirds. And you also mentioned the word volunteer, and I'm very familiar with the word volunteer. I, I do that <laughs> in, in a lot of different ways. But I'm also curious about the partners of Alabama Audubon who help make your mission hopefully a success year after year and make it easier for you to continue to do the great work that you're doing. Who are some of the partners that you're working with? Yeah, we definitely do not accomplish our mission by ourselves. So we have our awesome staff. I believe there's eight of us total, nine, four of us down here and five up in Birmingham. And then we have a handful of really fantastic volunteers that really help us to expand the capacity of the work that we do. But I have to give a huge, huge shout out to our funders for our coastal program. This includes the Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, the Alabama Trustee Implementation Group, National Audubon Society, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife. We literally could not do this work without the funding that they provide. So we are super, super thankful for them. And then we also have all of our partners who allow us to conduct surveys and monitoring on their properties. And this work requires um, their partnership as well. And, and I'm curious, for all of these partners who are involved, I would imagine there's a coordination of, or, or, they, have, or they have a specific mission if, that they're focused on. Is there overlap? Do they, do they stay in their lane? And how do you coordinate with them so that it's a smooth running operation? Yeah, there are a lot of really incredible environmental organizations that are working to preserve this region, like the Mobile Delta region. And each of them has kind of like their own individual lane, whether it's water quality or working with birds or working with turtles and the list goes on. And there is overlap that we try and support each other however we can. Uh, rising tide lifts all boats. And so we're really thankful to um, support them as much as they support us in whatever way we can. I'm sorry, what was the original question? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Okay, you're giving me a, a place where I get to edit. Thank you so much. No, I was just, <laughs> I was just curious about the, the coordination because you've got some big these funders. <laughs> The okay. Alabama Department of Conservation, Natural Resources. You've got TIG, uh, which the the implementation group. Okay. What was the T again? Trustee Implementation Group. It's a mouthful. Trust, trustee Implementation Group. And you've got the National Audubon. You've got the, the Fish and Wildlife. So there's a lot of hands in the right. mix in that coordination. And I was just really curious how you're... Yeah, you kind of make sure you, everybody knows these are our marching orders. This is what we're doing here. Yeah, so the coordination for all of the work between these organizations does require great communication. And we have been working with some of these partners since the beginning of our work down here on the coast. So now we kind of have an established um, schedule of the way that things need to run and when we need to submit reports and requests and stuff like that. But there is constant communication going on, which is great because full eyes on a project helps to really bring it to life. So lots of lots of communication that goes on across nonprofit, federal, and government organizations. So okay, and your use of volunteers. I'm I'm again. I'm going to make an assumption that if I was down in Alabama and in, in the Gulf and I wanted to volunteer. I just need to come to your website and there's a, there's a place for me to go to volunteer. Yep. If you go to our website, alaudubon.org, you can find out information about all the work that we do in the programs that we run, but specific volunteer opportunities. We have different capacities that people can volunteer depending on what their interests are. Everything from 
we have a couple different citizen science projects that go on throughout the year where if they specifically want to be a part of our team that goes out for bird surveys or if they specifically want to be the team that goes out and does bird stewardship on the beach you can find all the information on our website and then it's just a matter of reaching out to whoever coordinates that so very, very good now one of my uh, peers from the outdoor writers association of america suzanne downing was down in the gulf shore is helping to plan our, our event in september and she did some bird banding is that a part of your organization as well, or is that another organization? Super cool experience to be a part of. There are a couple different organizations that do bird banding on the coast, including us. We do band some of our shorebirds to help see if they are sticking around or where they are going to for different habitat, um, if they're successful in their um, raising of chicks and stuff like that. But we also have a super unique event um, in April. It's the third week of April that we do every year. And it is the coastal bird banding event down at Fort Morgan. And this event is focused on songbird banding. So Dauphin Island and Fort Morgan are really unique locations because whether birds are heading north in the spring, that Dauphin Island and Fort Morgan are kind of that first landing spot that they come across after they have made that big leap across the Gulf of Mexico. So they're super tuckered out and they're looking to refuel themselves. And so they stop in this habitat and we have mist nets set up and these birds will fly into the mist nets. It doesn't hurt them. It just captures them. We work them up and then um, put little bands, little bracelets on their legs and then we send them on their merry way. And those bands help other scientists that recapture those birds to, again, see the habitats that they're using and how far they're migrating and stuff like that. So it is a super awesome up-close look to get to see some of these migratory songbirds. Some of them, like, you know, our cardinals and our grosbeaks and blue jays and stuff that you might see every day. You get to kind of see the more detailed up-close look at them. But then we also have some really cool and uncommon species that come through as well. Fantastic. Well, I am... Um... So excited to get down there and I'm bringing my camera with me. I suspect awesome. my, my, my lens is a long lens, but, you know, as a, as a photographer, the next best lens is a little bit longer, but I, I'll make do with what I have. <laughs> Always. Which brings me up to my next question for you. So we're going to be coming down in September uh, <laughs> and really excited. What can we expect from Alabama Audubon in your participation with the conference for the, of the Outdoor Writers Association of America? Yeah, we are looking to offer a couple of different um, like field trip opportunities for people who are interested to come out and join us. And we're really going to try and show off the best of the best of what Lower Alabama has to offer in terms of birding. So not only do we have a great um, variety of shorebirds and seabirds but like i mentioned earlier we have that fantastic habitat that holds a lot of really cool songbirds as well and so hopefully when you guys come down we'll be able to get some really great lists species lists for you guys to take back and brag about and in september you guys are in that fall migration window so you never know what is going to be coming through and despite it being Probably still pretty hot, a little bit buggy, a, a lot of bit humid. You guys are going to get to come down here when you're not birding. You're going to meet some really welcoming people and you guys are going to get to experience some really great food and just um, hopefully get a good view of what makes this area so special. That is fantastic. Now, I have a question and it has nothing whatsoever to do with this conference, but you've said it a couple times. So I love Las Vegas. We're, we're kind of running out of water in a way, but there's some <laughs> wonderful locations, the, the Desert National Wildlife Refuge, there's Paranagat, which are on that migratory path. There's Ash Meadows, which is also on the migratory path. It sounds like Alabama, and especially the, the Gulf Shores area, is a great place to perhaps relocate and, and uh, just enjoy good food, the nature, and... Uh, hospitality i'm thinking 100 percent. i've only been down here a little over a year but i love it i it was not at all what i was expecting 
but I have really come to enjoy um, Mobile and Baldwin counties and then adventure a little bit further into northern Alabama. But I um, mean, yeah, the people are great. The food is fantastic. And the, um, the fishing is great. The birding is great. I can't complain. It checks all the boxes for me. I, I love that. I love that. Now, before we head out, Courtney, on our show, we have two segments that we love to uh, introduce to our guests and, and be able to share with our listeners. The first is what we call the aha moment. And these are when you, as a professional with, with a story to tell, and you are sharing this wonderful story about the great work that you're doing and the experience of folks coming down to, to Alabama in the Gulf Shores area with a, perhaps an interest in birding and photography and then some Question for you is when you kind of look back at your really young career, I mean, you're, you're still, <laughs> you're a newbie, okay? I am, I am. But what, what's what been your aha moment? It's like, wow, I get to do this. I have had a lot of aha moments throughout my young career that remind me that this is exactly what I am meant to be doing. Just those incredible nature moments that continue to remind me what it is that I'm fighting for. But more than that, my aha moments is really any time that I get to see somebody else experience an aha nature moment. You can see it in their eyes. You can see it in their face that something just clicked and they are making a connection and a memory. And I think that's so cool to get to be a part of. Um, one example of this is a couple weeks ago, I had a lady come up to me after a presentation and tell me that she has lived on the Alabama coast for 80 years and never knew that birds nested on the beaches. And those types of things keep me going because it reminds me that this work is needed and it has the potential to create good change for these birds. And then one other quick story is that I was leading a bird walk for a group of like 20 people. We were seeing birds that most birders would probably consider pretty common. And a lot of these people might have seen these birds before, but not known what they were. Some of the birds really cooperated, which doesn't always happen while you're birding. And they sat there nice and pretty and allowed us to point out the identifying features. And at the end, one person came up to us and she said that we had made a birder of her that day and that the veil had been lifted from her eyes were her words. And birds definitely gained another advocate that day. And that is so special for me to witness and be able to call work. Fantastic. Now, I have one question further to what you've just shared. Young kids are so impressionable. And I know okay. just given in the area, there's probably field trips all the time. Did you ever get any young kids come up to you afterwards? I mean, maybe they ask you, well, how do you do what you do? And how can I do exactly what you're doing? You ever get that kind of experience with kids? Yeah, we do for sure. And those are awesome moments as well. I was giving a presentation to a group of um, certain fifth graders and just a basic presentation of, hey, these birds are down here right in your backyard and here's how you can help them kind of thing. And two different kids raised their hands. One raised his hand and asked, if I want to work for Alabama Audubon, what kind of degree do I need to get in college? And I that just that just melted my heart that they would even consider wanting to do what it is that I was talking about when I was sharing with them and help protect those birds. And then another student raised their hand and was like, I know that I'm really young, but I really want to help these birds. Like these birds need my help. What can I do? And so they are these young, impressionable minds. And just giving them that information and planting that seed, you never know what that is going to turn into. So I really love getting to go into classrooms and work with the kids as well. How cool is that? When I hear from individuals who are in these positions, kind of like you, is it educating and just being able to share your enthusiasm, what you do is just, it, it's phenomenal. And I think it's just, I mean, this is what's going to help create the next generation after you is is to, to have people like you share that enthusiasm. So I, I really want to thank you for, for doing that because I know just from hearing everybody else, it makes a big difference. Before we head out, one last item is what we call our insights to go. And this is your opportunity to share with our listeners. It could be a quote, a book, 
an experience that you would like to share with them, some piece of insight that they can take away from your experience as a professional uh, working with an organization like Alabama Audubon? What would be your insight to go that you'd like to share with our listeners? I would leave with a little educational tidbit. Two fun quotes to remember to help protect our birds if you find yourself on a beach where bird nesting is going on. The first is fish, swim, and play from 50 yards away. If you are in an area with active nesting, staying that 50 yards away from those nests really helps make a difference in the nesting success to those birds. And the second saying is, if the birds are squawking, keep on walking. We want to be respectful to birds while we are bird watching. So whether these birds are resting or feeding or nesting, if you are near them and they start to kind of like ruffle their feathers or get vocal, you know that you're probably a little too close. So just to step back and give them a little bit more space. I love it. I love it. And we really appreciate you sharing that as well. Now, if our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, where are the best places for them to go? Definitely check out our website. It is alaudubon.org. It's a great resource for learning about our works and our program and the bird walks that we have going on throughout the state and also ways to volunteer if you want to get involved. And then we also have a Facebook and an Instagram. So I recommend everybody listening today to go ahead and give that a follow. It's a really fun way to stay up to date with what we have going on Um, just across our programs across the state and to hopefully see some adorable baby birds that we'll have coming this summer. Fantastic. Well, we are definitely going to provide the backlinks to Audubon.org as well as your Facebook and Instagram pages. Courtney, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the Outdoor Venture Series podcast. And we really appreciate your your willingness to to join us in the the world of podcasting and kind of sharing not only your passion, but the message about the work that you're doing and really laying the groundwork for others who might follow in your path. So thank you so much for taking the time today. We really appreciate it. Thanks. I appreciate you having me on. All right. Listen, stay in the line. We're going to do a quick close and you and I can have a final chat. Okay. All right, folks, we have just been chatting with Courtney Weatherby. She is the Coastal Outreach Manager for Alabama Audubon. We have learned so much today, not only about her background growing up in Nebraska and then college in Missouri, but then how she found her way down to be near water, which she is so passionate about being near everything. And I really, really admire parents. I grew up in in the in an urban setting, and I think we went out to st- some state parks, but that was pretty much it, just kind of hiking around every once in a while. But when I hear stories about parents that really introduced their children to the love of the outdoors and the activities that they can also participate in, whether it's hiking, climbing, angling, or fishing, hunting, hiking, and birding, it's just, it's just a wonderful way to, it opens up a whole other world for us and really enjoyed uh, not only uh, hearing about some of the tools of what it means to be a birder, good notebook, a pair of binoculars, uh, but also some of the great apps out there, Merlin and uh, eBird. Again, we're going to provide backlinks to that. And we learned a lot about the uh, Alabama Audubon and the organizations like the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources from the state of Alabama, the Alabama Trustee Implementation Group, the National Audubon Society, and of course, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, all coming together to partner, to sponsor, to support the great work of the Alabama Audubon and really Audubons throughout the U.S. Now. I know I'm going to have a great time coming down to uh, Gulf Shores in September for the Outdoor Writers Association of America's conference. But hey, if if, uh, Gulf Shores is in your itinerary, you should really, really check out Alabama Audubon. Find them on their website, again, on their Facebook and Instagram pages, and make some of their programming part of your activity as well. Yes, you're going to have some great food. You're going to enjoy the great white sand beaches. But you also can get out there and explore the best that Southern Alabama has to offer in terms of nature and conservation and access and really just 
get out there and slow down a little bit and enjoy yourself. Now, as for us, you can find this episode on the OutdoorAdventureSeries.com. You can find our pages on LinkedIn and Facebook at Outdoor Adventure Series. And you can also find us wherever you get your podcasts from. Any of the podcasting platforms, just search for Outdoor Adventure Series. Okay, folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day. And we will see you on a future episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. Take care now.